hi guys thank you for joining the live stream thank you for waiting i'm uh, very late today and today we have with us for the second time ever madam political scientist thank you for joining us madam political scientist yeah thank you again for having me here and today we are going to discuss uh, the the weird love hate relationship that communism seems to have with industry progress prosperity uh, sometimes they hate it sometimes they love it cpim did the same thing they industrialized then went out of power when they tried to industrialize and we will also get into a bit of uh, china's history of deindustrialization as well so ma'am uh, where should we start why don't we start first at uh, with mao what did he do and then we'll learn what their sasta versions did okay so uh, i think we had discussed this a little bit in the previous podcast as well hmm. that uh, when whenever these communists have come to power what i notice as a, a trend that i notice in every scenario is that they do not build anything truly new they do not create anything that is uh, truly socially valuable or relevant rather hmm. they simply uh, either take over what is already existing like a virus does you know so yeah. uh, it just infects something that is already functional or mm. they completely destroy it mm. so uh, in the previous podcast we had uh, discussed about how when uh, mao first came to power the communist uh, revolution first happened in china mm. uh, there there was a thriving uh, you know business enterprise in shanghai there were many thriving business enterprises in shanghai before that hmm. but when the communists came to power it was mainly through gherao and yeah. uh, through occupying by occupying the places of power yeah so uh, and when they did that a lot of uh, the business owners in shanghai they committed suicide and what did the state do the state simply occupied what was already there Mm. rather than you know building something from scratch because they they have nothing to build from scratch they don't really have a creative philosophy they have more of a destructive philosophy mm. so uh, you look at anyone from uh, you know institutionalized communist states to ultra left uh, terrorists you look mm. at the whole spectrum they all talk about destroying what is already there and if they are not right. destroying what is already there they are basically infecting it like a virus these are the only two things that they do when have they ever really spoken about creating something new even in theory or even in practice and uh, whatever uh, new they may have tried to create has either been a myth or a fiction myth bolbo na a fiction or it it has been even worse even more destructive like you know um, what was that uh, you know legend that the communists created in the soviet about uh, pavlik morozov i think that was the name of the boy so uh, this this is a uh, let me just check if i'm right uh, hmm. yes pavlik morozov so this is a story about a boy. it's it's actually a story that was uh, repeatedly fed to children in the soviet uh, to create a sense of communism within them from a young age hmm. the story was about a little boy who uh, reported on his parents for storing food grains okay yes, so it was yes. such a right yeah mm. so uh, his his father or someone was storing food grains and this little boy such a great communist he was mm. that he reported on his parents for doing that and the state tried to you know co-opt the grains that was being stored by the family yeah. and uh, because the boy reported on the parents i think the uncles or aunts or somebody killed yeah. the boy very brutally yeah okay so this is a very sad story of he was treated as a martyr family. deified as a martyr as a martyr yes 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 he was actually deified as a martyr very yeah. very good use of words actually because he was indeed turned into a uh, godly figure yeah. now uh, notice something are they really first of all first of all you'll find youtube videos of uh, you know soviet survivors who who say that okay I, only later on in life did i come to know that this was entirely fictional hmm. none of this was true yeah. okay so first of all their whole bullshit is based on a lie yeah. they try to generate these huge emotions based on a lie hmm. and apparently they even you know uh, acted it out on stage in school dramas and all of that so this was the 
the one story that you have happening everywhere uh, in in the in the in the cultural sphere of the soviet mm. union and only later you'll find people confessing uh, not confessing you know reacting that uh, okay this was a total lie none of this was true mm. but what i'm trying to bring your attention to is that notice the uh, pattern here they are being forced to return to myths and legends which which are the basic natural form of human culture okay so all their attempts to undo myths to undo religion to undo uh, i don't like to use the term religion while describing pagan cultures but for the lack i yeah. mean just just for the sake of you know this conversation let's call it religion yeah so they are trying to undo uh, religion undo mythology undo uh, everything that is traditional but ultimately what are they doing they are returning to that same structure of mythology hmm. okay and uh, they are unable to really create something radically new that is not already done before by the entire human race okay so pavlik morozov has nothing to do with industrialization that we are discussing today but yeah i thought of you know i, I just while talking i returned to that just to show that hmm. be it anywhere be it in the practical material economy yeah. or be it in the realm of culture Hmm. be it in the realm of uh, deification and uh, yeah. pseudo religion ultimately they have nothing new to offer yeah they are simply going and either they are destroying what is already there or they are simply uh, copying it you know yeah. copy pasting uh, they are trying to the, reinvent the wheel and in the, in the end making a worse wheel <laughs> or wheel doesn't even yeah. rotate <laughs> yeah it doesn't even rotate yeah how about their exactly. invention of uh, equality okay so um, that is the one of the greatest attractions of communism right hmm. uh, even uh, when i was very very small so when i was in school uh, i remember in class 7 uh, 8 or something like that you know really mature really stupid yeah. so back then uh, this idea of equality is a very quickly uh, it is an idea that very quickly attracts young people Hmm. because on the face of it it's a very good idea hmm. okay because no matter which country we are in we are going to see some amount of inequality and that inequality is going to expose us to some amount of relative poverty right and in poorer countries there's going to be extreme poverty yeah so any any place on earth that a middle class kid grows up in is going to be exposed to some amount of poverty hmm. and any kid with a with a you know untainted heart will honestly want to do something about it and feel even if they can't do anything about it they'll want to and they'll feel that okay inequality is a problem hmm. these poor people they are not get they're getting what i am getting or i am not getting what someone richer than me is getting something hmm. like that so they they uh, they hanker for a solution hmm. they seek a solution and imagine uh, you know well intended young people like that when they cannot find a solution and when they cannot understand that inequality is also natural this is yeah. a very uh, dangerous view according to communists okay yes. that to accept inequality right but fact of life is that inequality is is a part of nature you right. look at your own hand all the five fingers are not the same this is the, this is just the basic thing mm. no two leaves of a plant are the same yeah okay so inequality is is just uh, natural okay yeah. but the human human beings are raised to think that you know inequality is the root of all evil and hmm. therefore equality appears to be the solution yeah. and uh, marxism begins uh, the, the way in which it is propagated begins with that premise hmm. that uh, the ultimate aim is to have this utopia and in that utopia everyone is the same but uh, the question that we must all ask is uh what kind of equality are we looking for yeah because i think a lot of these right wingers and uh, sensible people will tell you that there are two kinds of equality primarily mm. the one of opportunity and the yeah. one of outcome yeah. and of course equality of opportunity is something to strive for mm. so that no one really gets left behind in terms of uh, uh, you know potential yeah uh, realizing their potential but what is equality of outcome that is what the communists are proposing equality of outcome that uh, you know it doesn't matter what your background is uh, 
you it doesn't matter how meritorious you are because yeah. merit itself is a product of privilege that's hmm. that's how they think hmm. so they don't see merit as a product of uh, hard work but simply yeah. a product of privilege and that creates a sense, a sense of resentment yeah. okay so how much was a, how much was marx uh, really talking about equality did he want an equal society where everyone has the same post same credentials same job profile what was the equality he was talking about so if you read the if you read his german ideology there he is talking about how every person can realize whatever he uh, whatever talents he may have and you know whatever he wants to uh, pursue hmm. something like that but that's just a tiny one liner in the entire uh, yeah writing. that sounds like equality uh, of opportunity yes but that's that's not the entirety of his work he doesn't talk hmm. about equality of opportunity per se he doesn't hmm. call it equality of opportunity yeah. but he more mostly it's a very utopian idea of uh, hmm. you can pursue whatever you want to pursue hmm. which is also not the reality of the world hmm. but uh, in terms of whether marx has discussed equality or not he has talked about how after the capitalist phase you will reach a a, a phase of communism where uh, the proletariats will own the means of production so um, and and that will create a classless sort of society because uh, apparently uh, the when when the workers become the owners of the means of production and the owners of the the regulators of the state then there will be no class left anymore what does that mean does the does the factory laborer run the business somewhat like that but not a laborer but all laborers which is uh, a, a weird situation and it's not really uh, possible so what ends up happening is that laborers don't actually run anything but yeah. rather uh, the party runs everything yeah so we have to distinguish between what we imagine might be the theoretical aspect of it and what actually happens in reality yeah so what is reality, even the theoretical aspect so today uh, the the music composer or the spot boy who's bringing tea is supposed to also finance movies or supposed to handle the entire <laughs> production team i i don't think they actually thought it through uh, that's what hmm. i feel that i don't think they even thought it through because this is a very uh, difficult question for them to answer and uh, in fact uh, if a, if a uh, if you ask um, someone about if you ask a budding communist about mm. whether or not private property is a bad thing yeah. and this is where they begin actually inequality and all that they mm. located down to private property right. so they're saying private property is the root of all evil and uh, but intellectual property is also a part of private property right mm. so if the budding communist is writing a very nice uh, is drawing a very beautiful picture or mm. composing a very beautiful piece of music mm. and then that becomes a state property Yeah. then then what happens uh, yeah. all the communism will fly out the window yeah. so i think there was a very good movie about this about um, tetris the game tetris okay. and how it it was uh, uh, it was one of uh, a soviet citizen actually invented the game because mm. uh, the tetris if you look, if you look at the game it's uh, based on very basic um, imageries right yeah. there's not much complexity in the imagery yeah. because he had to work we had to make do with limited resources yeah. but it's a very addictive game and whatever in the movie the, what they show is that uh, despite him inventing the game he could not uh, uh, he had to struggle a lot to gain the rights to it in fact he didn't even try to gain the rights to it personally per okay. se no it was a it was an american capitalist who actually in, came in and uh, then the question of private rights and all of that came about hmm. marketing and all of that came about yeah so that that's the reality of communism where uh, even if you if you produce something intellectually it hmm. is not yours uh, to market one thing, it is not yours to exhibit yeah one thing that has always uh, surprised me uh, ever since i guess ha- started having some confusion about and some curiosity about really the solutions proposed by marxists what is their problem with hoarding which we discussed in the beginning that 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 kid that fictional kid basically complained about his parents to the government because their parents were hoarding that was is called in bengali mojuddari mojuddari mm. so why mm. why shouldn't you hoard like during uh, corona it was proven that the people who weren't in fact hoarding the, the hand sanitizer etc they were the ones who got screwed trying to trying to be nice to people and trying to be uh, polite uh, communists 
you are you are supposed to hoard why, why shouldn't you save for things do we yeah. always wait for a famine mm mm-hmm. mm so hoarding is uh, like you said you know it, it is also a part of human culture for many generations that's how we live Hmm. Okay, that's how we save. Not what human culture; it's a part of animal culture also. Hmm. Uh, don't animals also hoard food who yeah. hibernate or whatever? You know, animals yeah. who who don't come out in the extreme cold, hmm. they also hoard food. So, our bodies are designed to hoard food. Hmm. The the bellies, the, the yeah. hump of the camel, they're all hoarding food basically because that's the natural tendency. Hmm. Okay. but communism is not natural <laughs> it's artificial and it's unnatural and it's against uh, everything that's not not just normal everything that's organic and natural so okay so your question is what's their problem with holding yeah uh, i feel uh, I, there are two answer to I many two points hmm. in my answer uh, first of all their problem is with private holding hmm. okay so if the political if the communist party is holding no one has any right to say anything about it okay so uh, i think in one of your pod- podcast only we i was listening to it and uh, uh, you guys were discussing how the communist party is actually one of the richest parties in india yeah. right wealthiest in india yeah. so so where where is the if the party is holding then then they are not complaining about it uh, yeah. but if you are privately holding for your family whom you actually care about then yeah then it's a problem uh, mm. and secondly i feel that uh, the second point is connected to the first that mm. if you are holding mm. then you are becoming individually powerful no if every mm. if every individual family if every community uh, every uh, jati group begins to uh, fend for themselves take care of themselves they will not be dependent on the state anymore yeah communism communism lives on the idea that the citizens will become dependent on the state that is yeah. why they attack entrepreneurs that is why they attack private businessmen because those are the people who are independent and uh, uh, who who don't depend on uh, sarkari nokri you know so government jobs uh, for mm. for an income okay mm. so they are the real threats to the uh, system communist system and mm. communists just want good compliant employees they mm. are no different from capitalist enterprises to be mm. honest and i think i told you i had discussed this with you before that mm. uh, there is uh, capitalism continues within the communist world as well yeah so the this, the opposite of communism is not capitalism the opposite of communism is actually uh, free democracy liberal democracy free mm. market yeah so yeah so i think that the to answer your question is they just don't want uh, ordinary people to become powerful that's right yeah. and if you hold you you are able to sustain yourself without depending on the state yeah now uh, how did mao start his deindustrializations and were there any similarities between mao's policies and cpm's policies directly here okay so uh, regarding mao's deindustrialization i honestly i have to uh, study about it a bit more hmm. but uh, i was actually reading up on cpim's deindustrialization as well hmm. which is something i've had to you know do before as uh, you know i had to yeah. study it um, in the past as well so hmm. i could answer that part hmm. um so cpim had initially in the 1990s they hmm. had uh, campaigned against liberalization hmm. you know when our economy was opening yeah. um and it was a necessity to open our economy because uh, for for decades before that the nehruvian license raj had crippled our economy hmm. uh, crippled us in many ways first of all the nehruvian economy that we were following Hmm. led to a closed market yeah he ensured a closed market and what did the closed market do hmm. it allowed only a certain group of very small group of capitalists to prosper yeah okay and it reduced competition for those capitalists by not hmm. allowing foreign companies to compete with them in the indian market yeah so in a sense the indian market was served up to these big capitalists um for you know uh, it was it was their own playing field nobody else was competing with them hmm. and not only were foreign companies um, forbidden ev- uh, even indian people yeah. ordinary indian people could not rise to a point where they hmm. could compete with the big capitalists because yeah. of of india because the, because of the license raj yeah because in order to start any business in order to uh, be a uh, 
you know a businessman or entrepreneur whatever you want to call it you had to acquire so many licenses mm-hmm. which involved so much corruption and uh, bribing and all of that and networking mm-hmm. which ordinary people did not have access to yeah. that even indians could not compete with these big capitalists whom nehru had favored mm-hmm. okay so uh, what ends up happening is that you end up with a country where just a tiny group of very elite yeah. businessmen are running the market yeah. and they are reaping the benefits hmm. outsiders can't compete insiders can't compete hmm. now what happens due to lack of competition hmm. any place that lacks competition is also going to lack uh, competence you know, productivity competence yeah productivity all of that hmm. now uh, there's a very good book called uh, locked in place where all of this is given in great detail most of what i've learned about the you know industrial history of india is from that mm. book okay. vivek chibbert book locked in place okay so there he has compared india with south korea i see he's saying that both the countries gained independence around the same time mm. but uh, south korea was a highly became a highly advanced economy mm. whereas india deteriorated mm. okay now why did this happen and he uh, brings he locates the problem in the manner of industrialization Hmm. So India the manner of industrialization was import substitution import yeah. substitution basically means that you you don't uh, allow foreign people to trade here uh, you know you you stop importing and instead of importing you substitute that import with you know stuff produced in India yeah now that's okay you make things in India that's fine but the hmm. thing is at least allow competition within that yeah. but even that was not allowed yeah and uh, whereas south korea was an export oriented economy yeah. and in the book he has argued that um, state involvement is not the problem because mm. uh, even in south korea the state was heavily involved okay but the difference is that in india the state basically created a pampered class of uh, inefficient uh, groups you know elite mm. business groups whereas in south korea the state incentivized competition by yeah. creating an export led economy Have you okay. ever Ex- spoken to any commie about these comparisons between different countries, and what would be their arguments in favor of CPM in this case, when when faced with direct evidence of one country doing better for because of not doing communism? Uh, actually, I have stopped talking to Marxist people. You know, uh, there was there was a time I had to tolerate them, but uh, now I pretty much stop talking to them. But no, uh, we never. I don't have memories of discussing this per se. Hmm. Oh, maybe even if I did, you know, they must have kept quiet because what can you what can you argue against something like this? These are just facts. Hmm. They can't argue against this. But I do re- recall one conversation I had hmm. with uh, an acquaintance, hmm. and uh, she she's uh, she was a. Uh, sort of an ultra left person and uh, her mother was a school teacher i think a government school teacher or something hmm. and uh, so i i mentioned the mother's profession for a reason hmm. because with her the conversation i had was that hmm. unionization is a bad thing i was saying that unionization is a problem hmm. because when you unionize you um, are basically asking the businessman to Uh, wrap up his business here and go somewhere where unions are not happening where the mm. unions are not bothering him okay and what ends up happening is the workers don't get their rights the mm. businessman just shifts his business to to a new to to to, to a more uh, compatible place yeah yeah and the workers don't get their rights on top of that they become unemployed yeah so, so this was so my argument therefore they should and declare the unemployment allowance <laughs> because oh yeah because they were left behind uh, by capitalists so her her argument was that uh ah, so no rights are important rights are important you know they should fight for their rights i was like okay but fight karte karte to sab khatam hi ho gaya they they don't have anything to fight for if the factory is closed and the businessman is leaving what will they fight for i like that so, so fine if they, and i was like they're going to lose their jobs they're going to be unemployed then what then then and fight so for she, vietnam fight for vietnam no, and, she, and iraq <laughs> yeah and her response was actually yeah okay yeah so they'll be unemployed okay yeah yeah what now, do you th- okay ma'am uh, i'll ask you about yeah. mao and the steps exact steps of deindustrialization by cpm again and remember that none of our viewers are uh, are phd's okay so whatever you know is more than my my audience knows more than i know okay 
so no okay. gyan is um, too too low for us but before that <laughs> what is this argument that uh, cpm supporters uh, make from time to time that okay no matter what happened in uh, in cpm era at least the poor people were better off what do you think they base this argument on it's a lie they base it on a lie they base it on imagination fiction or you know delusion delulu they base it on delulu so yeah, yeah. it's a lie of course they were not better off and uh, even even now i would say they are they are uh, not really better off i mean where most of them are migrants you know so many so many bengali laborers go to kerala or go to other places you know, bangalore this that gujarat also for jobs their so argument is that are they are now going because of trinamool's policies not because of their policies they they uh, if you study migration patterns i think you will find they have been migrating for a long time hmm. this is not a trinamool uh, impact and right. trinamool is also essentially running on the same principles that were set by cpm i don't see much difference the only difference i see is perhaps a less of an attack on ramkrishna mission maybe that's it mm-hmm. uh, if they <laughs> right. had actively attacked ramkrishna mission trinamool yeah. may not be actively attacking it true uh, other than that other than that policy economic policy wise what i don't see many changes really yeah trinamool uh, is essentially cpm's evil twin <laughs> yeah you more evil twin yeah yeah <laughs> yeah um so uh if if there weren't actually any poor people whose lives were getting better who was helping yeah. prop up this lie and maintain this lie because someone or the other knew right people like uh, aparna shain or the cpm party workers they probably knew what about their yeah. party workers in the in the bottom level who were also probably not becoming rich uh, who was propping up this lie and in what ways and what were their personal gains out of this both party workers and non party workers civilians cpm supporters what was going on about this myth of poor people re- being happier in west bengal uh, okay uh i you will find a few academic works like those of uh, atul kohli and a few others hmm. like who will tell you that it was a very stable regime and with that there there is going to be the assumption that stability is because people were happy hmm. and people did not protest Hmm. but they did, they they whitewash the part that stability is because opposition was suppressed hmm. they don't they don't mention that part so right. some academic of course had a role to play hmm. and uh these you know these theater people these uh, film film people hmm. uh, they also had uh, aparna shain to she, she, so many movies she's made uh, showing sympathy for uh, yeah uh, bhatkawa youth naxal youth what hmm. what is the term uh, भटके हुए युवा भटके हुए या 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 सो शी इज मेड सो मेनी सिंपैथेटिक फिल्म्स फॉर पोर्ट्रेइंग नेक्सल्स एज यू नो यूथ हु आर गोइंग इन द रॉन्ग डायरेक्शन और रॉन्ग नहीं दे वोंट कॉल इट रॉन्ग मिसगाइडेड यूथ राइट सो दे ऑफ कोर्स फिल्म पीपल एकेडमिक्स दे ऑल हैड अ रोल टू प्ले इन क्रिएटिंग दिस इमेज यू विल फाइंड द सेम थिंग बीइंग डन विद क्यूबा दे विल से हेल्थ केयर इन क्यूबा इज द बेस्ट kaha hmm. but i don't know where the proof is but you'll find every single communist saying this healthcare in cuba is the best in the world yeah and i mean i don't know then why are people migrating to the us why not migrate to cuba yeah so yeah there's a the, there are people elite people uh, in elite spaces controlling the narrative like that and as for ordinary people their role uh, i i have just uh, one point to say that is they had very little choice Hmm. because in west bengal unlike in other states in west bengal your very survival depends on the political party if yeah. you are if you are a working class if you are a lower middle class or very poor person hmm. your very survival depends on the party hmm. and if you don't choose a side and if that side is not the winning side then you are basically digging your own grave yeah. so if poor people don't have a choice then obviously they are going to support the party continuously no even today uh despite the morichappi massacre you will find uh, dalit people who are uh, also from east bengal who will still support cpm because they used to be beneficiaries of the party once upon a time so yeah because they had no choice they had to you know take a side yeah uh okay that reminds me guys uh friday 4 pm professor salvator babones is coming on our podcast and saturday i have not announced it yet as of yet so far if if everything remains same saturday uh, evening 7:30 pm deep haldar is coming on our podcast 
who is the uh, king of researching on Modi Chappi, basically, and along with him, Ross Malik, of course. We'll try to get Ross Malik on the podcast also someday. Uh, anyway, ma'am, what do you think of this uh, argument that uh, since they did not resist, uh, it is actually fair to say that the government uh, was functioning well because isn't it the people's duty to resist no matter what? If if at all you are th- that much in trouble, I'm reminded of this especially because uh, there was a far left commie anti vegan not non vegan that yeah yeah you do your thing that seems to be a nice anti-vegan. thing he was and he was anti-vegan. against veganism so his argument was that animals don't deserve any rights because they don't have something called collective resistance uh, so when uh, when you uh, put your hands inside a cage and try to bring out a hen to eat it they are not united and and shouting a clear slogan it's just individually they are they are fluttering about and trying to escape for their lives so that's not resistance uh, that's that might be resistance but that's individual resistance that's not collective resistance therefore we must eat them so that was the i guess the policy that cpm also applied on on bengali uh, people that these people don't have collective resistance so that just let's just chop them up yeah that's a very good analogy i agree with you yeah that's that's probably the logic by which they run uh, but yeah. or justify their actions yeah. but it's a stupid logic such a stupid logic just because a group is not united you go and cut them up what on yeah. earth is what kind of a logic is that <laughs> so by that logic you know most uh, cosmopolitan urban spaces don't have a, a community hmm. right because yeah. you know everyone is new there does that mean you go and cut them in, <laughs> you know you, you make life hell for them Yeah. It's such a stupid logic. I mean, I tell you, these commies they will uh, go to any extent, make the most illogical and even genocidal arguments, just just to top up a few basic points that private property is evil, collective action is always good. You know, some of these basic uh, Marxist points they will uh, justify, uh, they will bring up, and to justify those points, they are gonna. come up with any kind of twisted logic but since they do have so many phd's in their rank so many professors uh, are you saying all of them are uneducated or corrupt how are they on the side of real credentialed academia but you are accusing them of having illogical arguments how does that work uh i think to call them illogical one only needs common sense and a heart some yep. empathy okay you don't really need um, a degree hmm and secondly but how are no, we seeing days. the logic and they aren't even though they are more educated what's where is the problem here uh i believe that some academics are benefiting from party networks hmm okay uh, if even if they are not directly getting jobs hmm. at least they are making building connections getting published you know uh, building their profiles because if you are writing uh, i i i I'll give you one example from my own life. If you are going to write articles that support uh, economic development, that support uh, India, okay, or uh, that that show that you know people want uh, a good, normal, functioning life, that they are not constantly looking to be radical and mobilizing and political all the time. If you if you if you are going to portray that image of India. you're going to face a lot of difficulty getting published yeah but the moment you try to show oh you know minorities are rebelling all the time and everybody hates the government and uh, there's so much disruption happening and there's so much mobilization that's showing the country in a bad light yeah. you're going to get published very easily hmm. so right uh, i think it, it's it's being incentivized this right uh, their bullshit is being incentivized hmm. their lies are being incentivized hmm. and not everyone is going to be honest uh, or not everyone is going to be truly patriotic okay mm. some yeah. people are sell outs yeah forever in some every group are so yeah. yeah and so they will they if because nationalism and patriotism are not incentivized they yeah. will um, go for whatever uh, pays them more i yeah. i don't mean money wise i mean network wise access wise mm. you get the idea right yeah Okay, we have an uh, we have a viewer here asking a very nice question. What was the role of move the movie industry in promoting pride in poverty? In Bollywood, we had movies like Jaane Bhi Do Yaro, uh, which promoted pride in being poor. Yes, yes. 
so a uh, very very good point actually mm. now problem is you know i i hated these bollywood and these tollywood movies so much that i don't really and throughout my childhood my teenage years i really did not watch them much yeah. but uh, whatever little you know i was there with the maid was watching them on tv or mm. if my grandparents were trying to pass some time so yeah mm. i would sometimes get a glimpse of these stupid movies mm. so and in it you will always find yes the poor character Uh, begging and uh, not begging you know uh, the positioning of the poor character is also interesting always sort of kneeling down and with the hands up in the air mm. and then another poor character very gigachad poor character is going to come and save that poor guy mm. uh, so that sort of an imagery always portraying poor as uh, as, as a sort of vulnerable and good and powerful and brave at the same time mm. i mean make up your mind which is it yeah. so uh, anyway um So yes I think films had a role to play in uh, this and another thing is you'll notice especially Bengali film industry um it used to be wonderful at one point of time Bengali mm. films uh, if you go back to uh, you know there is this film Golpo Holo Shoti one of mm. my very favorite films you know so that there was an era of Bengali films when films were truly critical and uh, uh, thought provoking mm. but uh, you look at the kind of films we saw the c grade movies that came out when we were children hmm. okay they were unwatchable okay hmm. all of them had the same formulaic story of domestic strife either the mother in law is evil or the daughter in law is evil and the father in law is always a side character who never has any power hmm. i mean uh, okay and the husband is always either busy in work or with having an extramarital something i mean such yeah. bullshit such formulaic same repetitive monotonous bullshit in every film so predictable hmm. okay and i feel that uh, one role that these kind of stupid films play is they make you stop thinking Hmm. Yeah. When you're when you're fed such bullshit nonsense uh, uh, which is uh, so basic okay yeah. then it is it is not making you engage with the work anymore yeah you are just pumping your brain because it's just pure uh, basic entertainment so you don't even need to participate in that entertainment anymore whereas you know films like a, a, a very good film would actually make you do some homework before going <laughs> Yeah. a good film would actually require you to engage with it yeah. okay any any film that is actually critical uh, you know it, it would require serious engagement of the spectators hmm. but uh, these films did not and what did that do it created a mass of people who were more compliant more easy to control yeah because if you are feeding them uh, you know a mind numbing uh, thing then hmm. that is going to reflect in their behaviors as well yeah so you notice this you notice the steadily declining trend uh, of bengali film industry especially yeah. from the 70s onwards yeah rohan Especially except maybe yeah, yeah. satyajit ray and others yeah yeah rohan rohan is saying hemlock society was also good uh, but it was actually a remake isn't it oh okay which was this is this about nri or something no hemlock society or... was uh, suicide club Oh yes 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 wasn't oh, it, I did wasn't it a remake of some some english movie or some Maybe. some non english uh, western movie i think as far as i know it's a, it's a remake okay okay uh, okay we have another great question here what is the impact of gayatri spivak on today's bengali academia are her theories as impressionable as they were in the 80s and 2000s okay um uh, well this is if you uh, read her works hmm. in original you'll find that it is a uh, like a hologram so there is a uh, there's a lot of cloud on which something is being projected hmm. but you go through that cloud you wade through that cloud you reach the basic core it's very basic and simple hmm. so um, i think a lot of these very famous elite um, uh, uh, if you want to call them elite you can call them elite authors whatever hmm. they thrive on that uh, creation of that cloud of um, ambiguity or that cloud of um, uh, what do you call it uh, difficulty around their language the mm. use of not just jargons but also complicated sentences and things like that yeah sir so, roger scruton actually quotes uh, gayatri spivak in his book uh, a political philosophy and then says that uh, has has a term for this called gobbledygook which in fact was also cited by douglas murray ha uh, yes uh, and we had to read her a little bit <laughs> um 
yes for ma we had to read her so i have read her in original and uh, <laughs> it it just comes down to a basic point that uh, which i feel is a very uh, what do you call it a classist racist point one could say because the you know her famous question can the subaltern speak so uh, her her question is premised or, or, or the rather the if there is if there could be a response to that question from her end it appears to be that the subaltern the subalternity of the subaltern is in the fact that the subaltern cannot speak okay okay, okay. the moment that the subaltern is able to speak hmm. uh, he or she does not remain the subaltern anymore i see this was what i got from the writing hmm. but um, i feel that that very stance is a very uh, it's a very classist stance because who, are you even listening what the subaltern is saying no that immediately also incentivizes not being productive not being competitive not being good at your work because if you if you if you actually succeed in life that that means you are not subaltern and therefore don't get the subaltern goodies and credentials and brownie points therefore no no this not subaltern <laughs> yeah and uh, yes exactly and and also it is i i feel very elitist a perspective mm. but i'll also tell you one more thing i am not against difficult language i am right. not against good heavy language yeah but <clears throat> that heaviness should have a coherence and it should not be just for showing off mm. that's my point because yeah. we also had to read uh, pierre bourdieu Hmm. Pierre Bourdieu is a French sociologist. Wonderful, hmm. wonderful writing, and Pierre Bourdieu's writing is also very difficult. Hmm. Okay, for okay. very difficult in the sense, I was able to go through it, but I did not feel like I was, you know, wading through mark. I was wading through some really, you know, uh, icky stuff. No, I, hmm. I, it felt good to go through that book. Okay. Okay. Um, there is also Rolla Barth, French again, and uh, great theorist and. again his work is very very dense okay mm. very dense in the sense that it's very uh, complicated it's it's it 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 is quite convoluted in in some places mm. but these are complications and convoluted things that you like to read mm. you will enjoy reading mm. okay so i i appreciate works which are difficult which are uh, uh, using jargons or hard language and everything mm. if they have a point to make Hmm. And if that point is really interesting, you read yeah. Rolla Bart, you will fall in love with his works. Okay, okay. same with you. But you will fall in love with it because because every sentence they write is so perfectly logical. Hmm. Okay, and uh, but the same cannot be said for someone like Gayatri Spivak. Honestly, not for me. I I don't know. Other people may love her, hmm. but I don't see the same kind of heavy logic that is embedded in every sentence. Hmm. in her world okay. actually in the, rather all i see is candy yeah. floss basically a tiny bit of sugar and you you know keep rotating it and you create candy floss out of it but the amount of sugar in it is very tiny hmm. and all you have in it is sugar you don't have any nutrition in it so some people do write uh, that uh, difficult language just because they are used to it they don't even find that language difficult and some people do write difficult language just because they want to come across as cool and it's not even really an era thing because when i first uh, mm. started reading sri aurobindo's life divine obviously it's the most difficult english book i've ever read in my life but i thought maybe that's just how everyone writes because he was uh, he, he he had already passed his ics exams so i thought maybe that's how everyone mm. writes later yeah. on i read uh, uh the history of indian philosophy by who what das gupta surendranath das gupta which is written in 1912 he has pretty simple language and then i'm reading fyodor dostoevsky uh, brothers karamaz of crime and punishment those were translated okay. in about i think late 1800s that english okay. translated by an american woman directly from russian to english seems like it's written by by me basically it's, it seems it's a 2024 english absolutely lucid uh uh right So, right. uh, how much is Gayatri Spivak still uh, relevant today in academia? We are asking for an insider's perspective on this. Is she still oh, okay. as worshipped? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. But uh, uh, not not if you are doing some. Uh, you know, her her area of work is subaltern studies mainly. Hmm. So 
if your sociological research is based around that top that kind of topic then yes uh, mm. you are still expected to uh, you know read her mm. and yes her relevance is kept alive by her fan clubs uh, in the academia basically mm. which is which is most of the leftist academia mm. so don't uh, don't be very optimistic about this she is certainly still you know given given plenty of space in, in academia mm. uh, but uh, if you're going to do relevant work in other areas of sociology like maybe economic sociology political sociology and mm. or, or industrial histories things like that you know mm. which are not really her area mm. then she's not necessary i i never had to quote her in my thesis so thankfully ha, so would you agree that sometimes a gimmick or a, or a novelty also thrusts people into the For, for, into the limelight because of the way they come across as the way they look etc because i mean would would gayatri spivak be uh, as famous as as a as a poster girl for progressivism if she did not have short hair and did not smoke all the time <laughs> yeah uh, i believe that's that's you're right yes uh, and this is evident in the fact that most of these girls from ju uh, press ju knew they try to imitate that no Yeah, Frida Kahlo. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, they they will imitate that uh, look and wear that kind of clothes, that hairstyle, that kind of makeup, uh, that kind of cigarette holding style, whatever. Oh my God. Uh, and and uh, that that why are they doing that? Because because they are non-conformist. Again, they are not conforming to anyone like you and me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, uh, so yes, they are actually conforming the most <laughs> yeah. for for getting advantages in their career. Yeah. But so stupid, really, because uh, your clothes won't get you that far. So yeah, just read a book instead. Now coming back to uh, CPIM and Mao. Yeah. Uh, what? How did Mao go about his deindustrialization? What did he? What? What were the steps he took, and then what steps did CPIM take? Okay, so uh, we all know about his. Uh, cultural revolution right i mm. mean uh, first of all what the the way you, they went about it was to um take over the industries that already existed okay and uh, what that led to was i we had discussed this before also that they linked pay with productivity therefore you know wages were linked with work bonuses okay. were cut down you know uh incent you know not incentives yeah what is subsidies and all that you know okay. all benefits hmm. were reduced in the after the communist takeover and so therefore you know the capitalist uh, free capitalist sort of uh, en- uh, environment hmm. business environment in shanghai yeah. was actually better because hmm. people at least got bonuses and subsidies but hmm. uh, uh bonuses and you know other benefits but yeah. post communist revolution that changed hmm. and uh, then you have the mao's uh, great leap forward right. and the cultural revolution both of which were disastrous uh, and they had uh, they could be f- termed a form of structural genocide because uh, you know hitler what hitler did was hmm. uh, putting people in camps and directly killing them you know physically Uh, actually killing them mm. and that was directly genocide and what mao was doing was of course mao also killed a lot of people it's not like uh, mao was not killing people directly mm. but these policies were done in such a way that they led to mass deaths so mm. where do you want to locate that kind of death right it is mm. also a form of genocide in a sense what was the so, situation like when mao came to power w- w- was there really a need or or sort of a hunger for for a person like mao or or pol- policies like his i cannot uh, comment on that too accurately okay. but from the little that i know um from the little that i know hmm. there was an organized support that was built hmm. but you know uh, these even in marxist theory and even in practice in most uh, communist uh, states there is this tendency to exploit the rural in favor of the urban hmm. okay even in marxist theory there is this uh, aspect called the agrarian question okay. so the agrarian question yeah. is the idea that uh, it's it's a part of marxist theory of historical materialism none of this is very complicated it's actually very simple uh, so he says that uh, human history has been a history of class struggle between hmm. the haves and the have nots hmm. and 
uh, initially it was a stage of primitive uh, communism where no one really had any divisions hmm. but as people started you know uh, living on agricultural lands they hmm. started cultivating their lands they started having differences and inequalities and one tribe started you know taking over the okay. other which led to slave society yeah. which then run took the form of feudal society which yeah. then later on took the form of capitalist society hmm. and his prediction was that the ultimate aim would be to preach a communist society now uh, the agrarian question why i mentioned this was the story of basic story of historical materialism yeah. and the agrarian question uh, says that when you are transferring from feudal to capitalist society hmm. uh, there will be a, a surplus in uh, agrarian production Hmm. which will lead to the creation of capitalist society right so the assumption was that the rural will produce more and more hmm. uh, and the that will be useful for funding or you know or for you, the, the crops will be used or for g- the, gener- the generation of the surplus will be used for creating the urban industrial spaces hmm. so this idea of exploiting the rural for the urban was actually quite uh ingrained in theory as well hmm. and if you look at most communist states hmm. this has been implemented in practice as well look at uh, west bengal yeah look at the difference between the privileges enjoyed in calcutta versus the situation in the rural areas hmm. even in the cpm era yeah okay and the irony is that cpm one year after uh, you know every five years also based on rural votes so the rural yeah. people also supported uh, you know at least voted for cpm yeah but like i said you know it was also because they had no choice because once communism comes into a place hmm. it breaks down all previous attachments all previous social attachments and the only social attachment that is allowed to continue is the attachment to the political party hmm. this is true of most exactly. communist spaces yeah and especially west bengal therefore you know all caste based mobilizations in west bengal mm. were you know not allowed or mm. they, they simply were not allowed to take place yeah uh, religion based unit unities were also not encouraged mm. even family yeah. even something as organic and natural as family mm. is not encouraged yeah. because even in marxist theory private property and family are interlinked Hmm. because family is the medium through which you inherit fi- private property hmm. and thereby inherit uh, privilege and create more and more inequality hmm. so this is the this is why even family is demonized so you can imagine hmm. a, a a political party that attacks the f- structure of the family yeah. is bound to be uh, unnatural yeah oh now we have some uh, important questions uh, no great questions that we need to talk about uh, ruthvik is asking uh, I I I know it might not be in your exact field but if you want to take it both your take on why are west and japan the only category creators and what is indic sociology what what might it look like okay uh the west and japan are category creators yeah okay meaning i guess uh indices terminology anything whatever they say that happens oh, that sort okay. of thing that sense okay well uh that can be attributed to the uh, academic domain mainly okay. that you know they have they have uh, invested sufficiently mm. in the academic domain which allows them to uh you know achieve that space where they will be they will be the category creators yeah and uh, in our country Uh, the academic domain post independence in our country the academic domain was mainly created as a way to justify the political domain in a yeah. way right or to justify the the left yeah it was the sense. pr arm of the government yes it was the pr arm of the left uh, of the left and of the government yeah. which was also tied with the soviet yeah. so um uh, when you have that kind of an academic domain then you cannot really expect uh, much novelty from there or yeah. much creativity from that yeah. space uh whereas in these countries i i guess to some extent the academic domain was allowed to uh, was 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 given more seriousness and was allowed right. to prosper in its own right 
probably this this is just my assumption i'm not mm. I, i don't think this is a very good answer on my part but okay. yeah that's what i feel and what might be indic sociology and what what should the government do now to to rectify this situation of academia which is absolutely kami anti india anti hindu etc okay uh actually uh, the answer was in one of your podcasts itself i was listening to it uh, okay. again a few days back hmm. and um, you guys were talking about how uh, sociology can be about studying indigenous cultures and hmm. doing statistical analysis of indigenous cultures as well to show how there's a demographic change happening and how many indigenous people are really uh, you know there compared mm. to before so yeah. this kind of statistical analysis could be one part where you're yeah. showing that there is a demographic uh, decline of mm. indigenous people uh, yeah. in this in this country right. um, spaces you can take different because you know pan indian research is uh, i don't think a very good idea because pan indian is a very difficult thing mm. there are so many uh, varieties so mm. take up local spaces and show uh, how indigenous cultures are declining okay mm. because that is also a reality yeah. uh, indigenous cultures are indeed uh, under some form of threat or the other be it through religion be it through other forms okay so you can uh, we we could do that kind of a study in indic mm. sociology yeah. and my own feeling uh, what i feel is that uh, we must also study the works of hindu revivalists and uh, from right from adi shankaracharya to later you know uh, people like uh, bonkim chandro i mean we have we have to uh, we have studied all kinds of rubbish in our sociology classes so mm. we need to revive the indian sociological thinkers more and i mean adi shankaracharya and all these people they are not they are not connected to sociology directly but if you read their introductory works you will get an idea of vedanta which will actually clarify your your perception of various aspects of reality forget sociology it will clarify your mind regarding how to see the world hmm. so uh, i feel that is going to you know be intellectually beneficial by default regardless of what discipline you are from and also it is going to root us in our culture right okay. so, what uh, is uh, sociology's duty according to you duty hmm okay why sociology uh, Uh, or why political would, science these these uh, sub- subjects uh see things like uh, m- more older subjects like history and all they have their justification in place actually hmm. but uh, a subject like sociology which is relatively new hmm. uh, i think it, it it could be useful for for studying uh, demographic change one okay. thing hmm. so for studying the populations and uh, ongoing uh, current ongoing realities and how they impact the culture hmm. because uh, and you know you cannot have sociology without history so yeah. it has to be connected with history and uh, the usefulness of sociology could be in studying uh, current ongoing developments uh, in our society and their their cultural impact their political impact hmm. things like that maybe who but i'll have to think yeah. more about whose yeah. works need to be studied in sociology uh, what is that based on like uh, i can understand ambedkar is read heavily in sociology because he was one of the foremost faces of uh, breaking or, or trying to fight caste discrimination uh, if if people like ibram kendi uh, are, are uh, read heavily in american sociology today who has no bio so many black authors black speakers their only big achievement in their life is that they are black and they wrote a memoir all of us and their first book is a memoir even though they have not done anything to write a memoir about uh, but then those books are read heavily in the in the name of uh, race studies and they get million dollars of uh, speaking fees etc so what's what, what on what basis do we choose because uh, reading savarkar's book uh, hindu rashtra darshan i got the impression that this man needs to be studied as soon as possible to understand indian history indian society not not to follow savarkar but to understand yeah. indian society yeah so uh, if you're asking whose books we should study and on what basis huh? and on what basis okay so if you if we i i feel that we should not give up on the founding fathers of indian sociology hmm. so we should study uh, binoy kumar sarkar hmm. we should also study um, mn srinivas gs ghure hmm. um, 
uh, and also i believe we should also study swami vivekananda hmm. and uh, why why if i must justify the reason the the, hmm. the reason being that uh, well binoy shankar for instance he has shown how there is a material side to indian history as well so hmm. most of us tend to think that the west is all about economy and politics and the east is all about spirituality and religion we tend hmm. to make this division Hmm. but binoy shankar has shown how even in the eastern civilizations you have economy and politics and material uh, you know uh, re- research based on material things yeah. so uh, by material i mean this kind of thing you know political economy so yeah. uh, that is a very big intervention i feel and binoy shankar hmm. had written this a long time ago hmm. so uh, his works will the reason why binoy shankar discussed these kind of things is also to build a sense of pride in our culture hmm. because if you show that our culture is only to do with you know snake charmers and uh, hmm. sort of a uh, 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 very half understood sense of spirituality hmm. then that is not going to create a sense of nationalism or patriotism within us that's going to make us think that our our country is probably not good enough okay so But is it is it sociology's hand, duty to inculcate national pride among students at in the college I or believe, masters level i believe it is every discipline's duty to do that okay um i believe so hmm. because you have uh, you teach someone you know any other discipline say some hmm. stem disciplines or whatever hmm. but they use that knowledge not to benefit our country but to go against it then what is hmm. the what is really the point i feel that hmm. nationalism and all should be your default for every discipline hmm. otherwise we are just creating <laughs> i don't know what we are creating either we are creating very selfish people or we are creating backstabbers mm, right so what's the point i feel sociology of course yes more, more most importantly sociology should also inculcate that sense of nationalist pride yeah. in us uh we have one interesting question here wait i lost the yeah uh again the, the person who asked about gatri spivak he's asking that i would really like to know whether there are any hardcore utopian socialists in academia today what do you think utopian yeah proper who want like a real communist or socialist state not just cpi cpi is too right wing for them are there okay. people like that in in academia today okay so these people who support naxals and all i guess they could be one example yeah but uh, right. how how significant do you think is the is their voice or, or what, what how many sort how, what percentage of people are there in academia who think that way I can't give you an exact percentage but mm. I have I have uh, th- the sympathy for Naxals is very systematically produced in the academia even today. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And it is produced in a very subtle way. So yeah. they will not directly tell you Naxals are good, we are bad. They are not going to give you stupid lectures like that. No, but yeah. they're going to they're going to give you a sort of philosophy which is going to make you think that okay, maybe it's time for a redo, maybe you know we need a tabula rasa and then from there we build on a more equal society mm. these kind of really dangerous thoughts are you know inculcated very subtly yeah. but uh, what we must always remember is that a complete redo is always based on destruction okay if you want a tabula rasa you cannot have it in 2024 okay if you want a tabula rasa then it means you want uh, to wipe out what is tabula rasa a clear slate right clean slate yeah so, a clean slate so if you want a clear slate and you want to restart society hmm. you are basically hitler because that's what hitler yeah. also wanted to do so yeah. i think we should constantly remind our students that that's not a very good idea yeah. and the naxalites are not too different from that yeah. they are also uh, they they are against society they are against bourgeois society because they call it and this is one tendency they have anything they want to demonize they'll call it bourgeois <laughs> okay if they don't like you they're going to call you bourgeois yeah Doesn't how matter. else are uh, they going to justify naxalism because they are going to go, go into the caste of the policeman who gets killed that's probably a brahmin probably landed and the maoist who killed yeah. him is probably a dalit best end of story yes and uh one more one more thing is they will uh, even if there is a poor guy trying to run a fuchka stall uh, 
in your neighborhood he's technically running a business so he's a bourgeois so yeah. they can use this logic of bourgeois to demonize anybody including poor people yeah i and think i think we should we should have a right to fuchka and equal distribution of fuchka is absolutely uh, a, 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 a policy i can stand by um uh, yeah. and i like digressions because there is, this is such an such an untapped topic there is so much to talk about so i don't mind digressions at all so we'll digress uh, a little more with two questions important questions here and then we'll get back to a topic uh, that uh, what is the love hate relationship between cpim and industrialization so the digression topics are how would you promote indic slash hindu sociology how do we keep it empirical and grounded in natural sciences because if it is hindu doesn't it get into realm and sp- spirituality realm and tantra realms that those sorts of things hinduism is not divorced from materiality either hmm. hinduism has both spirituality materiality all things hmm. we are not uh, the kind of religion that only advocates one variety of thought we are not a monotheistic hmm. religion yeah okay so uh, and you know um i will also now digress a little bit yeah. and uh, so if you look at some of these hindu rituals hmm. uh, like the griho probesh hmm. or you know th- there are there are parts in the griho probesh where you are supposed to take some food and leave it in the under the open sky hmm. and not look back hmm. okay you are supposed to come back and not look back at that so it is assumed that some form of uh, uh, you know pratatmas or some mm. form of uh, atmas that we don't worship mm. uh, some kind of negative forces they are supposed to consume that yeah. so imagine our dharma is such that we have even acknowledged the reality of negative forces mm. okay so called negative forces mm. so uh, we are we are not a religion that is going to forcefully impose only one variety of thought we have even we are simply a religion that constantly acknowledges the re- acknowledges the reality of all forms of existence right so therefore you, it is very illogical to think that if if you are going through a hindu re- train of thought then you are mm. going to give up on certain things over and above others mm. so we are, we are inclusive of everything really but how do we prioritize natural sciences in sociology if we if we try to bring in uh, indic principles so statistics could be one way we do mm. more statistical research mm. that could be one way right and uh, there a lot of the sociological research today the kind of really low quality sociological research that's happening mm. is based on just uh, one or two kind of stories that you uh, hear you you just go into the field talk to one or two people use mm. their stories and that your research mm. so that is not actually representing the field i feel yeah okay. either do hardcore ethnographic work where you're staying with the people for years and years and <laughs> documenting their life hmm. and you know right from the core yeah or do statistical research yeah what is this half baked kind of thing where you just go and talk to two people and then write about their experience and then that's your story that's your phd yeah okay so uh, i think the way i think that even without hinduism natural sciences are not being included in sociology yeah right so I don't think Hinduism is going to be a factor that pushes away natural sciences. Okay. If anything, it might be uh, inclusive. Yeah. So the way for sociologists. On, yeah, yeah. Go on. Yeah. Sorry. No, I just one small point. Hmm. There's a lot of the uh, very happening topic in sociology right now is gender and sexuality. Right. Okay. Nobody wants to do very difficult work on economic sociology or political sociology. They just hmm. want to or historical sociology. They will just work on gender and sexuality because there you have a lot of uh, one thing is you know honestly speaking there's a lot of sympathy to be gained hmm. so moment you work on women or transgenders you you're certainly very stunning and brave hmm. so uh, that that is one point hmm. but my point is even in gender you can do good work okay hmm. suppose you do a statistical analysis of uh, say female infanticide or bride yeah. migration things like that yeah. okay where uh, you you study how uh, uh, certain you know women from a certain cultural group are you know constantly migrating in search of husbands or things like that you know mm. gender also has very interesting work uh, that can be done yeah but instead of that all you do is whine and whine about you know how you're discriminated against and you really it, it's there's a limit to fiction so either call it fiction or just do real work so yes 
Okay, next we have a great question uh, be- after which we'll get back to the topic a little. Do you think classical Western liberal ideas like individualism, equality, feminism, capitalism, etc. need a rethinking? How relevant are they today? What to do about them? All the four things you mentioned are hmm. so uh, different from each other. Hmm. And so many times they have been uh, conflicted with one another also. Hmm. So, uh, feminism, of course, I believe requires a lot of rethinking. Because if you look at even the history of the Western feminists, hmm. the earliest Western feminists, say like Mary Wollstonecraft, hmm. okay, so their works were totally different from the later radical feminists. Yeah, hence okay. the waves. Second wave. Yes, hence the wave. So uh, even if we don't look at non-Western feminism, uh, even within Western feminism itself, there is such a desperate need to return to their origins and uh, hmm. uh, rethink their digressions. Hmm. Uh, as for individualism, uh, well, you know, it's it's a reality in the cosmopolitan world hmm, it's a right. reality even in, even in uh, traditional worlds because the this is entering this uh, uh, idea of individualism is entering even rural spaces today hmm, right. mainly through the use of technology yeah because uh, you go to uh, rural spaces you'll find pe- young people on their phones and they are gradually getting detached from the kind of social bonds that maybe their parents used to have with yeah. the joint family. Yeah. So uh, it's not as severe yet, but it is happening. Yeah. Uh, capitalism. Capitalism, well, it's a, it's a reality of life. What can mm. we do about it? Uh, <clears throat> the forms of it existed since the beginning of the human race uh, of trading. Mm. This is the beginning of trading and various forms of it will exist in the future as well. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and uh, are... uh, so uh, how did CPM go about deindustrializing? Did they did they just one fine morning tell the business owners to close down their shops or or factories? Uh, well, um, it's not as simple as that. <laughs> of course, they mainly did it through unionization, which is mm. why I have such a big problem with it. Mm. Unionization, right? So they unionized the workers and by unionizing them, they uh, put pressure on the business owners. And after a point of time, and if you make really unrealistic demands in terms of wages or whatever, hmm. after a point of time, there's it's just not going to be feasible to run the factory there anymore. And you're going to have to close and move. Yeah. Why were they so, making those unrealistic uh, demands? What made them think that this is a realistic demand? I uh, I don't think the leaders. Uh, okay, so let's fracture the uh, party uh, membership mm. into various parts. Mm. On the one hand, you have the chief minister and the ministers that that level. Then you have the uh, local committee members, things like that. Right. And you have the trade union leaders, and then you have the workers, right? Yeah. And you also have a few mid-range sort of politicians, mid-range mm. political leaders. Yeah. So. These are the various categories. So maybe at the absolute ground level, the workers who were you who were participating, maybe mm. they had some real hope that okay, our salaries will increase or whatever. Mm. But I feel that the people who were leading them were mm. not that naive. Mm. I do okay. not think that they actually hoped to get anything out of it because mm. uh, a lot of times these union leaders are not exactly uh, workers themselves; they are mm. outsiders who are influencing yeah. the movement. Hmm. So is their aim really to raise wages? Because once the wages are raised, they, their reso de is over. They don't have a reason to be there anymore. Hmm. So how to keep themselves relevant, how to continue to keep themselves relevant is to keep the mobilization alive. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that that was the way to keep themselves relevant. And even you, you if you read the works of uh, Al Dengelson, who has done a lot of work on West Bengal, in the communist era, hmm. you'll find that uh, he has also discussed this, that uh, CPIM was able to retain its relevance in the rural field because it kept the mobilizations alive. Yeah. Okay. Some excuse or the other, but the mobilization should go on. Hmm. Okay. So that is how, uh, and, and by keeping the mobilization alive, one more thing they did was they made themselves the new patrons in the rural areas. Yeah. 
So whereas previously the zamindars were the patrons, hmm. uh, after this party came to power and um, you know did land redistribution and all of that, the party politicians became the new patron-like leaders in the rural field. Yeah. So you captured the leadership space, you captured the mobilization uh, space, and you are able to churn the wheels and reap the benefits out of that. So then why did the they? Why did they want the uh, Tata factory all of a sudden after so many years? What changed their minds? So the Tata factory happened during Budhadev Bhattacharya's tenure, not hmm. during Jyoti Basu's tenure. Hmm. Most of what I told you just now happened during the Jyoti Basu tenure right. of CPIM rule. Yeah. I actually, uh, although I am uh, evidently anti-communist, hmm. but I feel that Budhadev Bhattacharya was not exactly the kind of a typical communist that we find hmm. in CPM. He wanted to industrialize the state, hmm. and um, he was uh, he was actually trying to undo the industrial damage, the economic damage that had been done by his own party hmm. over several decades. Hmm. Okay, so uh, yes, so I believe that his policy was actually different from Jyoti Basu's policy. I don't yeah. see him as a typical. CPM guy, although he is hardcore CPM guy, but yeah. I don't see him as following the same kind of uh, uh, policy. Yeah, yeah, why him? And if he had such different ideas, why did Jyoti Basu uh, basically uh, prop him up as the chosen one? I'm not very sure uh, how I should answer that because uh, I, I think there was a question of decline of popularity also of the party. Hmm. Because of the atrocities right. that they had committed for many years, hmm. uh, it was becoming unpopular, yeah. and maybe they needed a change of face. Hmm. But I, I believe there is more to this. There is, there are more answers to your question, hmm. and uh, I, uh, but a, a part of it at least is the fact that it was becoming unpopular, hmm. and therefore there was no need for this change. So they thought, let's do industrialization as well to fight this unpopularity. Uh, it could be that it could be that mm. because uh, the lack of industry was very severely felt in mm. in uh, west bengal mm. and like i told you i think in the previous podcast that you visit some of these areas which had factories before mm. you will find that there are just ghosts of factories remaining today yeah and uh, so that that gives people a constant reminder that this is what could have been and uh, instead we lost it all and yeah. uh, one more thing CPM did was, you know, infiltrate into family lives. You will mm. find at least one family member of every Bengali family who is mm. a communist. Even if you yourself are not, you will find some family member or the other who is. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, Swami Vivekananda's brother also, I think, one of his brothers was uh, affiliated to this party. So, um, yeah, so... Uh, that is one more thing that they did, that they, they infiltrated into every aspect of our lives so yeah. intricately that uh, there was a growing disgust for the party hmm. after a point of time and yeah. it, it needed some change. Do you think if at all the Shingur factory had taken place, uh, would it be yeah. faced with the same uh, crazy demands, unreal demands from their own unions? Ah, difficult to predict actually. For two reasons, because mm. Jyoti Basu was not the CM that time, okay, yeah. and uh, also because uh, you know at that time the towards the end of the CPM era, mm. their lumpen elements had gone out of control. Yeah. So what would be happening right now had started back then actually. Mm. Yeah. The the kind of violence, rampant violence, and uh, uh, biker gang uh, sort of. Mm. Uh, violence that uh, bike bahini the bike bahini yeah. sort of violence that happens in west bengal today actually started mm. in the end of the cpm era mm. so what would have happened that hypothetical situation is uh, not easy to predict because of these many factors number one the kind of cm we have we had we would we would have had in power would have been pro industry so mm. his influence may not have allowed certain things to happen on the mm. other hand if your lower level party workers are out of your control, mm. then anyway they've gone rogue. Then you don't know what they might do. Mm. Okay. So despite having industry, corruption may have continued and, uh, uh, you know, ground level situation may not have improved much. Things yeah. like that. Yeah. So it's, it's difficult to predict what 
may have happened yeah uh, one one interesting question has come up can you throw some light on the congress manifesto for 2024 election which i feel is a left academia <laughs> output it talks about wealth redistribution and things uh, so uh, all i know about the congress uh, manifesto for now is from the kushal mehra podcast that he did yesterday when we were do- discussing the cpm manifesto but yeah it's basically a, a communist manifesto only as as was cpm's as well uh but uh, what do you, what do you think uh, ma'am of this idea uh, are you are you are you aware of the congress's demands or or propositions in the manifesto i haven't studied it but you just mentioned wealth redistribution yeah so uh, how much uh, how much is the b- b- academia today in favor of congress do you think are they in total cahoots are, do do they think rahul gandhi is their poster boy he's going to redistribute all the wealth of the gandhi family <laughs> all the wealth of the gandhi family yeah. well uh uh well you know they are very uh, the, the way they will talk these academics the way they will talk it will appear very neutral hmm. initially unless they are direct party um, you know party placed by the party they will appear very neutral so yeah. at first glance you will not know yeah but yes of course compared to bjp they all of course they think that you know bjp is the bigger threat for them yeah. because uh, and very few academics will actually not think that i'm talking yeah. about humanities of course mm-hmm. i'm not yeah. talking about humanities because yeah. the sciences you have a uh, plenty of nationalist people and mm. uh, patriotic people yeah so uh, and pro hindu people as well normal mm. people but uh, in the humanities because it is so biased so mm. uh, yes of course there is a, a pro congress pro left bias mm. and if you tell them if you show them directly the problems in the congress party they will find some some stupid excuse like oh utna bhi nahi tha uh, itna bhi ab to bahut zyada abhi to undeclared democracy uh, kya undeclared uh, Or, emergency yeah, chal raha yeah. hai It's electoral like autocracy so <laughs> yeah they will find excuses like that now see there was always a pro congress academia right how did the yeah. pro left academia all of a sudden become uh, pro congress because why won't they see that it's their policies basically that's being uh, executed by bjp what is their their enmity with bjp why don't uh. they get any of bjp's policies bjp is not a right wing uh, uh, f- f- pro capitalism libertarian party by any stretch of the imagination it's not libertarian uh, yeah. but it is pro it is also promoting businesses like startup india hmm. make in india these these kinds of policies are also promoting businesses so i but believe whatever... bjp is actually the perfect uh, combination of both because bjp takes care of the poorer populations through things like swachh bharat hmm. building toilet giving electricity <clears throat> supplying clean water things like that hmm. building roads and bjp also promotes uh, business uh, environment but don't so, you think that in terms of uh, promoting a business environment bringing investments and actual in infrastructure development they are the, the only difference in this context between bjp and congress is the execution and and these mostly congress policies as well but they just could not execute them and if if yeah. so then what's the problem of the left academia that they won't find uh, be friends with bjp at all only congress uh i think the so the, the answer lies in uh, hindus hmm. so i think that the left is anti hindu hmm. and the bjp is unapologetically pro hindu yeah. so uh, if you are hindu and if you are a sanatani then hopefully you will realize that and uh, know who the real enemy is so, yeah i guess so, so you know, the are anti hindu that's it the only reason they prefer congress over bjp is that because uh congress promotes their atheism or secularism kind of uh, values or vibes gives off vibes that way yeah gives off vibes because you know the truth is congress has played with hindutva politics as and when it's necessary yes not only rajiv gandhi but even indira gandhi yeah okay and uh, rahul gandhi does the fancy dress hindu thing quite well mm. also you know yeah. all of a sudden he'll dress up in uh, saffron clothes and go to yeah. a temple Okay, he'll wear the ong but upside down. Hmm. So weird. Yeah. So, in fact, you know, my question was, what what actual bhakta would actually ever wear the ong upside down? Okay. 
I mean, I can only imagine a Pishach doing something like that. But wearing the womb upside down, my God. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a great question here. How do you respond to malevolent humanity, uh, humanities academics? Do do you do you confront them ever? I, why do you think I've stopped talking to most of my acquaintances? What like happens said, oh. in the staff room discussions then? Because you you must be surrounded by malevolent <laughs> humanities academics. Yeah, they don't have the courage to pick a fight with me. That's what happens. So they're very nice to me because they know that you know if they if they try to attack my religion and my country, I will I will educate them very nicely, mm. very politely with facts and logic. So they don't yeah. mess with me initially. Yes, before they knew me because you know I'm I'm not a very talkative person at first. Mm. I I try to stay quiet. So they think my quietness is uh, uh, showing my weakness or something i guess so at mm. first they try a little bit here and there but once i start defending you know they know not to cross a line so yeah. and so his second really the second part of his question is that does a critical examination of their methodology help discredit their theories mm, of course 100% oh methodology yeah okay uh is yes, there any, any yes. problem in the methodologies is there any problem in the methodologies themselves Yes, I yes there is. If you're talking about research methodology, hmm. uh, so like I told you uh, some time back that uh, just interviewing a few of your friends and writing a thesis on it hardly makes it a good piece of research. Yeah. So that is one problem, one error I find that you know they they take it too easy. Hmm. Another thing is, uh, um, th another problem is that. Um, there is a lot of bias and assumption already in place informing their work. Hmm. So I, I don't see much neutrality or objectivity happening. Hmm. Now, problem is, you know, in sociological research, um, they are very anti-science. So when we yeah. first, when I first started my first week of college, okay, hmm. um, the first week itself, the things we were taught were that was that uh, sociology is a scientific discipline, hmm. but science itself is not scientific enough. So oh. these were the kind of bullshit we were told right in the first week. So I hated right. it. I really hated the discipline right from the start. <laughs> but uh, over time, I realized that it's so full of stupid people that I could make it, maybe, you know, uh, maybe it's not too difficult for me to survive here. So, <laughs> yeah. What br what but, that brings to my mind? What do you think of Arundhati Roy's foreword to Annihilation of Caste? I have not read her foreword to it. Thank God. Um, I have to. I have to. Uh, to th imagine, I have to read it. It's so depressing. Yeah. But yeah, uh, what does it say? Can you please just briefly summarize? So I thankfully I could... read Annihilation of Caste without Arundhati Roy's foreword, and then I okay. talked to people who, uh, who who have the version with Arundhati Roy's foreword, and those people who go around claiming that they have read Annihilation of Caste have actually mostly read just the foreword, which is a gist with oh. with her absolute uh, her, her spin on Annihilation of Caste. So uh, okay. the, uh, what my key takeaway from Annihilation of Caste was that Amitkar is asking Hindus to be more united. And yeah. people who have read Arundhati Roy's foreword uh, and then read, in fact, if if at all they have read the Annihilation of Caste, their their takeaway is that Brahmins are bad. End them. So may, okay. Make sure that okay. they cease to exist. Okay. Uh, if that, if, I mean, if that's what she's writing, I mean, isn't she a Brahmin? I no, don't she's know. Roy. So I guess Christian, Christian Kshatriya. <laughs> Okay, so like a crusader or what? Yeah, Christian <laughs> she's a crusader <laughs> against against uh, people who want yeah. uh, Kashmir to stay in India. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and and she actually we had roasted uh, a, a video of her or an interview of her with Karan Thapar about a year back. She said that if the people want it, Karan, uh, Kashmir should be given away to, to the, if the people want it. Which people? The people of Kashmir, Kashmir, who live now, not oh. not the minority Hindus. Yeah, that's my question. So, do yeah. the minorities not matter in certain places? Yes, they they matter only They're nationally, not, not in state. Yeah, and more importantly, are Kashmiri Hindus not indigenous to Kashmir? Is the no. culture not indigenous to Kashmir? No, they are Aryans. <laughs> they came from Iran. And and and, and did, did did their brethren, did their Islamic brethren come even before that? 
that's not a problem they are also outsiders mm. but you see they are landless what they are landless what yeah. so the aryans are not only aryans and outsiders but also land owning and have the cap, uh, the, the wealth of knowledge because even that is capital but but the poor muslim uh, kind of indigenous pe- person doesn't have knowledge where doesn't have poor? where are the landless i don't see it i mean they, they, they became landless land only because well. they kicked out the landed brahmins so they kicked out a tiny minority yeah. and suddenly you became land owners yeah that 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 has been the argument forever yeah and uh, what do you think of uh, if we f- uh, if we get towards a world of uh, doing indic sociology how about yeah. uh, doing lots of research on uh, atheist explanations of uh, of hindu uh, activities spiritual activities uh, rites etc like uh, meditation yoga they, everyone knows that these things benefit the moment something op- becomes obvious that it has a benefit even though it was it, it was seemingly a hindu religious practice that's the moment they say it's not hindu anymore so in the same way uh, doing chants daily doing daily puja etc uh those will obviously uh, give you great benefits in terms of time management and basic discipline etc so uh is there any possibility of doing those things inside sociology that research on how uh, how an- anyone who is not even hindu can benefit from doing hindu practices because they have real life quantifiable benefits you could do that that is uh, of course possible Hmm. but i am always careful not to commodify my religion and exactly. not to turn it into a product for sale hmm. okay hinduism is not a a product that i'm trying to sell in the market hmm. it is it is an eternal uh, dharma hmm. that i i abide by hmm. and uh, for me it is sacred and hmm. i'm not i'm not denigrating trade i'm not saying trade is a bad thing but hmm. hinduism is for me more than just a commodity okay hmm. and as for those who who try to you know like you said that you know yoga meditation hmm. the moment they are universally useful they are detached from uh, hinduism yeah. but uh, i watched this video of this guy uh, this right wing american guy forgetting his name okay. christian guy so he is uh, very famous actually michael so, noels Yes, 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 yes. So he talked about how yoga is demonic and yeah, all yeah. that, how satanic or something mm. like that. Yeah. So what are you gonna do? I mean, you, you on the one hand there are atheist Hindus who are trying to detach yoga from Hinduism. On the other hand, there are religious Christians who are telling you mm. that <laughs> it is Hindu and therefore demonic. So please fight it out amongst yourselves and decide because Hindus are okay with yoga being Hindu. So my my argument for uh, getting into atheist explanations is th- that therefore that leaves us with room to uh, inculcate uh, as much Hindu studies as we want inside this thing co- we call liberal arts academia. Because if we do it by force without getting into the atheist explanations, then that goes into a lot of uh, things that are unquantifiable. Unquant- so why don't we find value in the quantifiable benefits in Hindu practice, so that they can be researched by anyone who identifies as a as an atheist, non-atheist, non-Hindu, etc. No, never, never, never admit that they are not Hindu. They are Hindu, yeah, but with quantifiable yeah. uh, benefits yeah. and and uh, yeah, provable that, benefits. That, that, yeah, I think that's a very good idea. that's uh, okay. also feasible i feel yeah. yeah the 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 follow up question to this very topic is that uh, what how much value do you place on this idea of lived experience where do you stand on it uh it is certainly important in both in research and in uh, you know uh, in in continuing history hmm. so i do i do believe it is important hmm now uh, again if you look at the way in which some of these leftist students use it hmm. it is not uh, it is not really done honestly enough because when you are talking about lived experience hmm. it is uh, if you if you are giving one perspective you must also give uh, the other available perspectives not yeah. forcefully <clears throat> but whatever other is available hmm. okay so I think that is important to take into account. If you're talking about lived experience, talk about it as holistically as you can. Exactly. Rather than showing just one perspective. Right. The 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 classical liberal or today's right wing critique of uh, uh, this idea of liber- uh, lived experience is that 
experience is always lived experience what other kind of experience there can be so why not just stick to uh, data hard facts statistics and and let go of this idea of lived experience completely i think they both have their place as long as we don't take it to an extreme hmm. okay you do statistical research that's mm-hmm. great hmm. whatever little you cannot capture through statistical research you use it through uh, these kinds of experience based uh, research hmm. but uh, don't make experience based research like the the basis or the core of your work because then you may have difficulty finding a direction in your work see yeah. the thing is i don't i don't have a problem with experience based research because if it is done very well hmm. if it is done if if suppose uh, i i think i had discussed this with you uh, there's this professor from cambridge uh, professor vitebsky who has hmm. who had lived in orissa for a very long time and studied the sora tribe and uh, hmm. he's uh, discussed the um, he's even written a dictionary for that tribe hmm. you know the their language is different from oriya also so this kind of work or maybe the works done by uh, melnoski who was one of the you know earlier sociologists who lived with the trobian islanders and studied them truly in depth and wrote about them that kind of work where you are actually giving time and effort into your research dedicatedly then experience based research may be useful hmm. but it really depends on how honest you are being in your work because if you're going for a couple of days and thinking you've gathered everything hmm. uh, writing on that without uh, you know doing in depth research or without doing statistical research then i believe it's uh, it's lacking some amount of honesty right so what do you think of yeah, considering uh, uh, experiences that come out of doing uh, tantric practices any 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 sort of tough rigorous uh, hard uh, religious discipline uh, doesn't that come under the realm of lived experience if if rajeshinandi says that he, he has experienced lord bhairava isn't that lived experience okay. and shouldn't that be taken into account to, while doing research on on these things uh yes it is it is lived experience hmm. uh of course uh, no doubt now regarding research on these things hmm. i have a small point to make that hmm. is whenever we conduct research on something hmm. we assume that we are the expert on that thing after a certain point after we've gathered <laughs> enough data and material we assume the position of the expert we think that we have acquired enough knowledge on that thing yeah okay <laughs> but when it comes to religious practices like be it tantric practice or be it any form of bhakti that we have hmm. for our gods hmm. or any religion really any form of bhakti anybody has for their god or gods hmm. um i think that that is more than just the position of an expert hmm. okay because an expert means you have some authority it means that you have some kind of uh, dominance over that field but when you are a bhakta hmm. then all this idea of authority domination all this goes away you are one right. with your with with the divine yeah. okay that experience it's 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 not the same as you know it, it is very different and hmm. research expert thought is very different so yeah. uh, i would what i would advise is carefulness be very hmm. careful when you are uh, conducting research on these kind of ritual religious things because hmm. these are profound things right. which cannot be easily captured in just uh, a thesis or something like that right and you have to be deeply respectful and uh, you have to be deeply uh, involved in this kind of uh, esoteric or in this kind of religious practice in order to truly you know, understand it from within otherwise otherwise what you're doing is you know not very different from what these orientalists did you know judging it from outside or whatever hmm. so, how much should... uh, uh, how much are liberal academics uh, aware of this difference between a scholarly approach and a practitioner's approach uh, well i have i i must confess that uh, you know this religion aspect is not my area uh, of expertise or research hmm. but i we did have to study a little bit of it uh, in ma hmm. we had a course on this from that what i could gather is uh, religious experience is uh, you know in the contemporary works hmm. religious experience is 
studied with some degree of reverence okay so okay. it's not seen as a guinea pig that you're studying in a in a mm. cage right. um, but uh, since i have not studied this uh, in great detail mm. so i cannot really comment on how most of the works on these areas how how they study religion mm. we have one uh, great question here uh, what are the best academic standards for lived experience studies what does this mean i mean how, methodological... how do we how do we make sure lived experience is just not complete hokum <laughs> it's difficult to do like i said mm. uh, one way could be uh, immersing yourself in the field honestly right. but you know these days the problem is even if you're immersing yourself in the field mm. how much are you doing your research because suppose you go to the field and just uh, you know sleep all day mm. you you're not really involving yourself in the field per se Hmm. and it's it's difficult to do honestly it's hmm. difficult to immerse yourself because why will the field accept you hmm. you are going to conduct your research but why will the participants accept you as uh, yeah. and and be honest with you yeah so it's actually very difficult to uh, achieve this yeah so true so, i i don't know how to respond to that question hmm. because it's 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 difficult to practice yeah now last two questions for today first is yeah. um since you are in in an in a, in a field which is uh, which, which is absolutely known to uh, be inside left wing and is going to look at things from a left wing uh, lens how did you uh, when did you realize that the market is not the enemy how did you come up on this conclusion okay uh when we studied globalization in college globalization mm. and development right we were taught it through the lens of post development thinkers now post right. development thinkers are people who say that development itself is a form of neo colonization right okay so they will say that development is basically american colonization mm. americanization okay mm. and uh, i thought to myself and i asked myself that uh, if if there is a lack of development mm. where the rest of the world is progressing and my country is not mm. just to oppose americanization then whom is it really helping is mm. it helping the ordinary people of my country is it helping me is it helping uh, anybody really except maybe the elites of my country who are profiting who are somehow still gaining some benefits yeah so that's that's one thought that uh, that made me feel that okay development and market and these things are are not the real enemy uh, another thing that made me realize this is also a, what I, whenever i studied the when i started studying the history of uh, communism in west bengal hmm. and in other parts of the world hmm. i saw that they have something in common and that is a closed market yeah. they would they would close off contact uh, in terms of trade especially and i began to ask myself that uh, why would a state do that hmm. how would it benefit the state and i realized that the answer was that uh, it makes people more dependent on the state and wherever there is a closed market there is also an attack on entrepreneurship there is an al- also an attack on indigenous businesses right so it's not just foreign business which is under attack but also business in say, any form of business really or market is only allowed if it is done by the state hmm. which creates a monopoly hmm. and whom does a monopoly benefit only those in power so not not ordinary people yeah. so that's how i felt that you know the market is not really the enemy and most importantly if you look at the oh, a very good book i would recommend hmm. is uh, jagdish bhagwati's in defense of globalization acha okay so a lot of good logic you will find in that book The, actually, it's literally influence of globalization. So. Actually, Amartya Sen's book, uh, uh, Identity and Violence, is actually a very, very big defense of globalization and neoliberalism. Out of the blue. Okay. Okay. It's it's okay. writing and like beautiful eulogy for for how misunderstood globalization is. Very interesting. Wow. Yeah. It almost makes you uh, feel suspicious. uh okay now before going to uh, the last question abhay is asking a great question here what made you realize that hindu culture was something worth being proud of 
were you always religious were you always proud of your hindu culture or was it a transition no i always loved my culture because you know from childhood i uh, my my mothers and fathers my both my both maternal paternal both sides uh, are religious and mm. maternal side is a little bit uh, secular also some okay. some relative mm. but nonetheless there is a nitya puja that happens in my maternal home every day nitya puja i see of uh, shiva mm. and from my father's side uh, we have durga puja Hmm. every year and every year we used to go to our village and uh, so i i have been very connected to the rural west bengal also I through see. that uh, so every year i used to we used to go to our village and uh, so watch the durga puja and so and i did not know sanskrit at all hmm. because i grew up in uh, my my schooling was in a christian missionary school okay. because cpm totally destroyed our education system my yes. father despite being a uh, a uh, very much hardcore orthodox hindu he felt mm. that unless he puts me in a christian missionary school yeah. i will suffer the same way that he did yeah. because he went to a bengali medium school and there were opportunities he could not access yes so um he put me in a christian missionary school which actually uh, brought me very uh, there was a point of time where i i was actually quite pro christian because right. of my school because you know my school did not tell me to be a christian okay mm. but my school showed me such pretty parts of christianity you know beautiful christmas carols very nice hymns very mm. nice music yeah this reminds That's me it. of of uh, ramkrishna mission's uh, book called the speak prophet muhammad uh, a collection of quotes <laughs> from from prophet muhammad which which makes you think yeah. islam is the best religion in the world yeah yeah so the same thing happens in christian schools so hmm. what happens when you go to a christian school is that you are proselytized from within even if you don't actually change your religion and hmm. that that did happen with me hmm. so uh, i i felt i see happened with me as in i did not want to actively convert to christianity but the thing is i grew up very 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 100% positive orientation towards christianity and hmm. uh, at the same time at home i have this sort of religious affiliation also hmm. uh, so and because my school never taught us sanskrit when i used to go to my village and watch the purohit you know do the puja hmm. i used to wonder that how ancient is this how ancient are these shlokas you know and hmm. what do they mean i always wanted to know what is he doing to the goddess what is he saying to the goddess and because hmm. you know the purohit in our in our ancestral home he used to sometimes cry Uh, while doing the puja because he used to be so uh, you know intensely involved mm. in the puja that tears used to come out of his eyes and i used to wonder why why is he so emotional what is going on mm. so i always had this curiosity it was more of a sort of scientific curiosity about what is going on but i also had a fascination because my religion is so ancient you know and eternal at the same time yeah uh, it's not primitive it's not stuck in the past but it's yeah. eternal and ancient so i always had a positive feeling towards this but one book actually broke my illusion about mm. my school <clears throat> and that was dan brown's da vinci code so uh, yeah when i read that book because in my eyes jesus was a different sort of a figure always mm. and the da vinci code showed him showed his other side the more human side of jesus yeah and uh, so after reading that book and that book actually brings out a lot of uh facts about paganism as well and mm. i realized that hinduism is also in a sense a form of paganism so yeah. um that book actually changed my views completely and uh, i became more pro hindu after reading that book yeah and afterwards in college one experience happened which uh, okay. also uh, made me more politically hindu i would I say i was always religiously hindu but <clears throat> in college we were uh, i i had taken a film studies class and uh, uh, they showed us a very well made film by one of our seniors hmm. which was just a two minute film a small short Achha. film two minutes hmm. about the gujarat riots hmm. and uh, I, the riots had happened when i was in school when i was in class 6 or 7 maybe hmm. so a long time ago and i was hmm. in college much later hmm. and uh, i and it was a very well made film which ended on the note that you know do does uh, uh does goddess durga only reside in hindu women does it mm. does she not also reside in 
uh, muslim women and right. why why are muslim women under attack and yeah. i felt so sad i was i was heartbroken that uh, can it be that people of my religion are committing something like this so so horrific right and uh, the entire 2 minute movie did not say a single thing about the train blast <laughs> and i did not know about the train yeah. blast at all <laughs> and uh, honestly i did not know because like i said i was in class 6 or 7 i yeah. did not used to read the news so much i wasn't so aware and suddenly many years later in college you see a very well made film and uh, you obviously obviously i felt very empathetic towards uh, you know the victims and because i thought there is only one victim there in the whole story and then incidentally that day itself i went to the library and i picked up a magazine which had the godra train blast incident okay. written in it. the mm. the cover page i think had the photo or something or uh, or just the title and then i read the article incidentally i think it was divine intervention really mm. because if that magazine hadn't fallen on my lap then i would not have been a pro hindu maybe yeah. because then i realized that wait a second so this blast happened mm. and so many hindu pilgrims were killed Hmm. but the film had no mention of this hmm. so do, do the lives of the people of my community not matter at all to the people who made that film yeah so uh, that that you know that uh, raised a question in my mind and i did not immediately become a political hindu or anything like that even then hmm. but it definitely raised a very fundamental question in my mind that made me think that okay uh, Do, do does my life matter does my existence matter does my culture not matter so that was the question and you know once you realize once once a question like that is formed in your mind uh, you become way more emotional about your religion your community right. so and yeah. uh, i have had friends uh, who until even last year i told them for the first time that uh, that was a retaliation to the godhra train burnings almost no one who uh, unless they follow politics 99% of indians even today don't know that it was because of the godra train burnings that triggered yeah. the riots the riot did not fall from the sky yeah it has been very well hidden the question is you see my question see some leftists will even uh, call that some they will attribute even that burning to some other culprits or something like that hmm. but my question is my simple question is why not even mention it Hmm. you're making a film on this incident at least mention why not even mention it yeah is yeah it, mention it, it mention and then accuse whoever you want say that modi go yeah. went and burned the train do whatever you want but at least yeah. why not even mention it that was that was what pained me you know that was yeah. what really gave me pain because it, it it felt like my my if if hindu people are not being represented it means i am not being represented hmm. all hindus are my brothers and sisters so hmm. if you are not talking about the pain that my brothers and sisters are going through it means something is wrong yeah even today no. most people yeah. don't know that 250 people died in, 250 hindus died in the riots 750 muslims died and yes, most yes. of those hindus were shot down by gujarat's police only yeah, yeah. and i wanted to make a point about uh, uh, convent schools uh, and uh, whether they push christianity or not because a great comment came here from uh, from someone from gujarat he said that in gujarat even the convent schools are pretty hinduized and that actually has by, been my experience as well because i have never felt that christianity was was uh, pushed on or even subtly pushed towards me i thought i never had any extra sympathy for christianity ever even though i also studied in a convent school but you see my convent school was in the hills where everyone is a proud hindu gorkha uh, yeah. and nationalism is in the blood of those people independence day is the biggest celebration in in the hills of bengal so yeah, yeah. Uh, uh every day our our school anthem which is written by rabindranath tagore and then the national anthem which is also <laughs> written by rabindranath tagore both of them used okay. to be sung every day and uh, that was the scene with my convenient uh, hindu uh, hi- kind of not so anti hindu con- convent school which uh, which seems to be the case in gujarat as well and secondly you mentioned that da vinci code sort of triggered you towards uh, hinduism and the da vinci code movie's background score has been composed by hans zimmer who is also going to do <laughs> some bit of collaboration with air rahman for the ramayan movie which has actually pissed yeah. off many people that why are these two abrahamics doing the score for ramayan <laughs> but yeah. uh, their criticism for hans zimmer is that we don't know we don't, we can't trust them they are they are going to be up to some shenanigans but he made he did the score for da vinci code which was opposed by christians all over the world 
uh, the, the, yeah, the yeah. movie got uh, uh, an adult rating it was called uh, people called for banning the movie in india christians in india did it yeah. and and hanzimar was the yeah. composer for that so so we can't be suspicious of hanzimar for this reason at least um yeah. and next there is a in- interesting question from a from an actual commie here we are very lucky to have him here hope he uh, uh, demonetizes my video so that we can equally distribute uh, his bullshit everywhere he's asking yeah. why do you think academia is dominated by the left but industry is dominated by right wing people even when sometimes academia pays well pretty interesting question uh academia the science disciplines are not necessarily always dominated by the left i i, I mean the particularly the humanities and social sciences are dominated by the left hmm. so why like i said you know the, why because they were politically instituted hmm. in place to defend the uh, regimes pr um, arm which are which are yes they are the pr arm and hmm. they they were politically instituted in that way and let's not forget that there was a point of time when academia was not as left as it is today yeah okay so binoy shorkar mn mm-hmm. srinivas they, they are also academics and they yeah. are way better academics than most of the people we find today yeah even jodhuna shorkar rc mojumdar radha yeah, radha yeah, kumud mukherjee yes there were nationalist historians hmm. and sociologists yeah. political scientists but over the years that was you know that the after that generation was gone hmm. uh, the kind of academics that was incentivized was this kind of left leftist academics yeah so even today ju jadavpur university's stem is almost uh, heavily yeah. i mean uh, abvp yeah. supporting yeah. yes yes there's hardly any left so, l- left left in ju uh, ju stem fields yeah. Yeah. Um but uh, his second part is even more interesting that why is the industries why are the industries filled with right wing people why aren't there any leftists in industry <laughs> uh, I guess people who live in reality have to live in reality that's why they yeah. can't live in a fool's paradise or a or an illusory utopia that's why maybe yeah. because industry in the real world you have to actually be real in it and i don't i don't think this is a, i don't think this is a very sensible question right wing okay. people in industry what kind of a question is that because uh, i mean even cpm supporters work in places right in the industry <laughs> so um right left regardless of everything most people are in the in in in, in industrial jobs yeah um <laughs> so i i don't think only right wingers per se are in industry all people are yeah. in industry so yeah. okay now the last question is uh is equality desirable and uh, should kids be uh discouraged from thinking about the uh, ideas of equality favorably even in their teens shouldn't we nip the communism uh, idea from from the bud when they are young itself when they are young themselves uh like i said equality of what kind equality of opportunity or equality of outcome equality of outcome Because is the only kind of equality they they believe in when they say equality right so whenever you think that equality of outcome is a good thing or mm. a necessity you should yeah. remind yourself that the only way to achieve equality of outcome is by uh, forcing it on people and every time it's been tried it's led to disaster what if there equality is the one time it might lead to actual equality no, no, no. what this, if think of it yeah okay fine but think of it logically what is equality of outcome it means suppose you and i are classmates and you study very hard for something and i don't study at all both of us get the same grade suppose you and i are both in the same industry working together hmm. you work you do nothing at all you put no effort hmm. i put in all the effort but we both get the same salary we both get the same in uh, uh, what do you call it um, the extra commissions or whatever hmm. okay does that sound fair to you does that sound fair to any child i don't think so any any sensible person will not think of it as fair that is equality of outcome yeah where you're forcing equal equal results on people outcome means results right hmm. so you're forcing equal results on inequal efforts yeah i think it that, always boils down to equality of outcome for the not for me no one wants to live as equal to each and everyone around them they just want to see equality as an audience from from far off yeah and uh, equality of opportunity is never discouraged by right wingers also equality of opportunity is a good thing there's nothing there's no real problem with that yeah but uh, you force equality of outcome you get unfair unfair results you get 
injustice basically but do we do we nip it in the bud should should kids ki, shouldn't kids be taught in school that equality is a bad thing equality of outcome is a bad thing you just give them logic i think they can figure it out for themselves you ask them you ask them that if all your classmates don't work and you do all the work do you think you should yeah. all get the same grade yeah. i think they will have the answer you know automatically so you don't yeah. even have to force it on children you don't have to force children to believe that equality of outcome is a bad thing yeah i you think more than them- uh, convent schools pushing christianity subtly i think equality is i think pushed even a little more overtly in all schools and that that creates a potential for all of these people growing up to be commies maybe and today you know the education system in the schools especially in west bengal it's it's finished because they've removed i think they've removed pass and fail from uh, up to a certain class and uh, that's that's also a problem because you're incentivizing lack of effort there again right so uh, and another very dangerous thing that they have done is they have removed jukta khor from bengali uh, script in in primary schools and the justification they've given for that is we are trying to simplify things for the children that that same fucking dumbass justification that we need to have kids in schools at no matter what the cost even a day might come when they'll say just no no we don't even know need to teach but you just need to enter the premises of the schools and and leave yeah. at 4 pm you just have to come in the school that's all people i mean children go for midday meals and come back that also happens exactly. in some places you know? exactly so this oversimplification of studies of uh, you know um, subjects is also a very big problem removing jukta khor that's that's a cultural attack on our language yeah. what is bangla pokhu doing about it okay because jukta khor is what connects us first of all it connects us to the sanskrit language yes okay and secondly jukta khor is also sacred to us you know the yeah. the, the I had once uh, heard someone say that uh the 51 shakti peets they are also connected to the alphabets and one of the alphabets is also a jukta khor i see so you know so th- this is so linked to our culture to our geography to the uh, you know the sacred geography and mm. to the sanskrit language so you are oversimplifying bengali by removing something so so uh basic to our language then then i think that's it's a cultural attack and it's a is going to you know dumb down the brains of the children who are studying it in this way i guess they would say that this is going to help the subalterns who who have a tough time reading sanskritized bengali that is so such an elite elite point to make you know to assume that subaltern cannot do anything <laughs> yes who are you to assume that? soft bigotry Can of low expectations decided? yes bigotry of low expectations <laughs> um Uh, can you give an explanation of juktakshar at least what it is uh, oh, abhay is asking juktakshar uh, abhay is juktakshar the the conjoined words like yeah can can you explain it a little uh, madam political scientist uh you just um, you know the how do i explain it in hindi uh even in hindi you have juktakshar yeah of course because yeah because uh, we need to just like find raksha. some examples uh yeah like raksha raksha is has a juktakshar right Hmm. the uh, the aksha part or the kshatriya kshatriya mein jo the starting alphabet of kshatriyas jo jukta ko i think yeah. right yeah yeah I, i i yeah i think so yeah so uh, that's a jukta ko where you have joint alphabets but hmm. what what they're doing in bengali medium schools in under this regime is uh, you know joint alphabets are supposed to be written in a different way they're not just supposed to be a sum of the parts but yeah. now they are turning it into a sum of the parts yeah so they're not giving it the distinctness that they used to have these alphabets used to have yeah and because they have decreased uh, the iqs of general bengali people for so many years with with poverty malnutrition of malnutrition yeah. is obviously going to cause uh, a decrease in iq in 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 <laughs> children so i guess mm-hmm. now they therefore they can't process or fathom uh, juktakshar anymore because that's how abrahamic scripts also work they don't have juktakshar <laughs> which is why any english book which is let's say uh, 300 pages its translation in bengali or, or sanskrit will be like 50 pages and 60 pages there's yes. so much wastage of time do and and realize, resources do you realize by removing juktakshar they are removing us from our hindu core also yes 
this like you said these uh, these scripts don't have the abrahamic scripts they uh, not abrahamic scripts but you get it right those scripts they don't have jukta core hmm. um so obviously this is removing us from the religious aspect of our language also yeah and, and of course uh, bangla people please bothered about it so okay. much they care about the language now our kami uh, brother is asking that why did you guys give bharat ratna to karpuri thakur who removed english pass criterion in bihar oh i gave the award i don't know <laughs> let me answer this uh politics uh works in weird ways like that's like god works in mysterious ways politics works in <laughs> mysterious ways politicians work in mysterious ways so who knows what political gain uh, narendra modi was getting out of it we don't know i didn't even know of karpuri thakur before he got that award but as for you as a cpm supporter uh, criticizing that that's hilarious because he just removed the pass fail criterion you all remove the subject itself uh okay uh okay then ma'am thank you for joining us uh hope to hope have you back soon yeah we had a nice conversation you. today thank you ma'am thank you thank you guys yeah. good night